Welcome to episode 231 of the Necronama.com. Tickets are now on sale as the official StokerCon pre-party returns. Spirited Giving, a horror-themed fundraiser, will take place May 29th at the San Diego Central Library. We will have live readings by Clay McLeod Chapman, Jamie Flanagan, Bridget D. Brave, Vincent V. Kava, Danger Slater, and Ai Zhang, as well as a live performance by YouTube horror narrator Mr. Creepypasta. And all of that is followed by meet and greets, book signings, photo ops, and more. All while raising money for the San Diego Library Foundation, particularly youth reading programs and the Books Unbanned Initiative. If you're planning on attending StokerCon, or you're in the area, you do not want to miss this event. It's going to be one hell of a night. Grab tickets now at www.spirited-giving.com and help horror leave a lasting impact on the community of San Diego. And I want to send a quick thank you to Fright Rags, one of our top sponsors for Spirited Giving 2024, May 29th, San Diego, California. Fright Rags has been bringing you the best in horror apparel and accessories since 2003, offering a wide range of products for your favorite creature features, slasher flicks, and cult classics. Officially licensed collections include titles like John Carpenter's The Thing, The Evil Dead, Creep Show, Jaws, The Halloween Franchise, and so many more. Head on over to fright-rags.com. Make sure to sign up for their SMS and email newsletter to never miss a drop. Listeners get 10% off when they use the code NECRO10, all caps, at checkout. I am James Sabata, horror author, screenwriter, co-host of the podcast you're listening to now. And while I haven't been to Mexico since I was 11, Don did give me the cutest nickname, Pendejo. No, no, it's it's uh, Pinche Hueto Culero. It means really cool cowboy. <laughs> I'll trust you, because why wouldn't I? <laughs> so when you hear Culero Pendejo, I think that's what yeah. it <laughs> Exactly. As soon as you hear that, they're like... That's when you go like, hey, or, you know, um, a lot of people might mistake you. They, you know, it might be a problem pronouncing James, so they might call you Bob. Uh, <laughs> but don't be offended, you know, Bubbo. So it, it's just like, saying, oh, this guy's really cool. He's interesting. We love him. <laughs> and I'm Doug Guillory, author, historian, educator, and co host of the podcast that you're listening to. And uh, I'm just going to say that this, this episode is brought to you by working vacations and how they are never a good idea. <laughs> oh, <man. laughs> oh boy. And our guest today, Alvaro Zaino Samaro is back. We love having you. Thank you for coming. Welcome. Back. Welcome. Thank you so much. Pleasure to be here. Uh, why don't you tell our listeners a bit about yourself, even though I think you were just here last week, right? No, I'm kidding. Uh, it's, it's been a little bit. I don't know who listens to what episodes. So yeah, just tell our listeners a bit about yourself. And I know you have a new book out. So let's talk about that, man. Uh, absolutely. So Alvaro Zaina Samaro, I am a science fiction fantasy horror writer uh, primarily. And I've published a lot of short stories, probably about 50 stories in professional venues. Also, I've published a lot of reviews in places like um, Locus Magazine. I have a uh, column that comes out every two weeks called Poppies of Terra, which is put out mm -hmm. by Hex Publishers. And I just had a nonfiction book come out at the end of last year titled Being Michael Swanwick, which is a set of uh, interviews with Michael Swanwick about uh, all of the short fiction that he's written in the last 40 years. And uh, I just had my debut novel published called Equimedian. And it is a science fiction slash experimental or um, kind of mainstream a alternate history that is very preoccupied with science fiction itself as one of its subjects. And uh, congratulations on the release. Thank you so much. Um, Locus actually just had a, a really lovely review. So for anyone that's interested in learning more about the book, 
if you type in Equimedian Locus, uh, Paul DeFilippo wrote a magnificent review of it. And uh, I think that that will give potential readers a really good sense of what the book is like and what the book is about. Fantastic. And then uh, you're also in an upcoming anthology I've heard of, something called Shadows in the Stacks that goes with some horror fundraiser called Spirited Giving that I never shut up about on this show. And uh, <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't know how to begin to tell anyone what your story is about, uh, but I will say that the first time I read it, I went, what the hell did I just read and why do I love it so much? And oh my God, we needed this story. And I went to the other editors and I was like, look, you're going to read this. And there's going to be part of you that's like, I don't even know what's happening. And I'm like, just, just stick with it. And both of them came back to me and were like, holy shit, that was amazing. And I just, I wanted to know if you could tell people what it's about, because I don't know how to do it without just totally randomly. You understand. Go ahead. <laughs> well, I'm I'm delighted to hear about those reactions. Yes, this is a, a story in Shadows in the Stacks. It's called Deface the Music. And mm. what I would say about the story is that it is a short story about uh, individuality versus, you know, groupthink. And okay. uh, maybe the, 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 the process that we all go through to kind of calibrate where our uh, where the boundaries of what we consider ourselves really are. Mm. Oh, I like that a lot. Oh, I'm so glad I asked you. That's so much easier than anything I have said to anyone else. So yeah. but really, it's just a story about two people that meet in a diner late at night. <laughs> if you want the, <laughs> the immediate description. Oh, that's fantastic. Uh, but yeah, I I was super excited when you joined the anthology and I knew that it was going to be good and it is one of my absolute favorite stories in it. And uh, everyone I know who's read it, like the publisher, even the proofreader, everyone's just like, wow, this is fantastic. And so I just really wanted to thank you for joining. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you for inviting me to it. I can't wait to see what the other authors have come up with. And you know, as, as we're talking about it now, I think that maybe in a way, the story itself could pair with this uh, film that we're about to discuss. Um, I, yeah, I definitely think that. A lot of it is about not giving you what you might expect in terms of how a character would behave in a certain situation and only mm -hmm. understanding after the fact what, what the motivation may have been. Definitely. Um, so yeah, so let's talk about the film. Why did you pick this specific film? I thought just in terms of the craft of the filmmaking, it was exquisite. I thought it was absolutely captivating from the very first frame. I loved all of the production elements of the film. And I do think that it's a film that invites the audience to try to judge the behavior of the main character, Neil. And mm -hmm. that's a process that constantly has to be renegotiated as you learn more information about what situation he's in. Um, and so I think it, from that point, it's really interesting because it pulls the audience in and where people land, I think, is going to say more about them than what's necessarily, you know, in the frame. But I just, I thought it was a breathtakingly beautiful movie. I like that. Mm. Yeah, I, uh, I, I definitely felt like we just kept getting different pieces of him. And I thought it was really cool how they captured reality in that way. Just... You think you know somebody off of like one thing you see or you expect something of somebody because they were this way the day you met them, you know, and right. the way that he changes so many times in this film, but it never feels weird. Like it's just we see it something new with him, you know, right, right. and man, they mastered that. It was absolutely great. Uh, as you both know, I adore spoilers. Uh, so I read spoilers going in and I was like, eh, this seems OK, whatever. And then I watched it and I was blown away by the production quality, the storytelling, but most of all, the emotion, the way mm -hmm. that they pulled different emotions out of me. I, I just, I was blown away by how good this is. I'm so glad. What about you, all Don? Right. Had you seen this before? Or? I had not. Um, and you know how, how much I had not seen this. I named two stories sundown. <laughs> never even crossed my <laughs> And they have nothing to do with this. Um, 
But I want to say this before we miss it. Yeah, yeah. Oh, oh my God. It was so good to see a movie that takes place in Mexico without that stupid filter. <laughs> God, <laughs> was yellow filter. So, I was so happy. And I, I, even, I can't remember <laughs> if I messaged you or told my wife. It's like, I watched this movie that was taking place in Mexico. Or at least they said it was taking pl- place in Mexico. But there was no brown, orange haze <laughs> everywhere. It was so weird. Um, I just I remember talk. talking about it with Saw X, where we were like, mm-hmm. "Oh, good, they brought in the filter, so we know where <laughs> we are." <laughs> <laughs> and and what got me and 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 Navarro's as as you're bringing up the the idea of the beauty of this. Oh my god! Like, I'm glad that this side of Mexico is shown visually, right? Uh, because the way. <laughs> People who travel to Mexico for vacation, like, you know, basically the way his family starts off, they're at the resort. They're at an all-inclusive resort, security, escorts, uh, uh, the chauffeur, they've got all that stuff, right? And the big argument that's always been made is if you're going to go, if you travel and you go to the resort, you never traveled. You just went on vacation. Yeah. Whereas his perspective when his family leaves, which we'll get into in a minute, when his family leaves, it's kind of like, just take me to a hotel. I want, I don't want to see the, the bullshit that I saw. And you see him like when he's with his family, he doesn't do anything. Yep. He doesn't want to do anything. Right. And that could be, I'm just saved for the moment. I could be thinking about the impending doom of death. I could be thinking of any of these things. Right. But you, you see a little change in him of, now it's not me sitting in a room or at the resort with my family. It's me sitting on this beach surrounded by people. And I have peace. I have calm because I'm not paying attention to anything that they're doing. I don't have to talk to anybody. I don't have to do any of this, these things that my family would expect when we go on vacation. Oh, we got to go on zip lining. Oh, we got to go on this raft. We got to go on this ride. We got to go see these animals, these types of things, right? Uh, whereas if you're oh, visiting... Yeah, yeah, the di- that that tripped me out because I'm like, God, you guys were dicks. Like, as soon as they came up, I was like, well, he was much better looking from a distance. I'm like, <laughs> well, fuck you, uh, first off. <laughs> and I, I think I wrote in my notes like, oh God, I hope she dies soon. And you know, I got my wish. But the the way that they show the interactions between people, the genuine way stuff happens, because. My wife is from the the uh, the beach town of Bahia de Quino. It's it's like southeast of uh, uh, what, what's known as Rocky Point, uh, Puerto Penasco. Um, it's south of there, so the they're both beach towns, but Puerto uh, Penasco is like touristy, right? And her town is it's a living community. They have tourists that come through, but it's not a tourist destination. So what you're seeing from his vantage point of Acapulco, it's this is where the people go. Because that beach that he goes to, that's right. not one that tourists are going to. Right. Because I've been to, the, not, not in Acapulco, but I've been to those beaches where it's like, you know, you know, Miguel, the 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 guy who uh, you know sell or rents the the umbrellas on the beach, he hooks you up. You go to this, you know, this place, and and Juan Gabriel, like you know, he'll set you up with a tent. You know, yeah. it's you right. you you know these people. It's kind of like you know, here's like twenty pesos for for hooking us up. Here's this, and and yeah, you will get crowded because it's an issue of like, yeah, you're going to be on a crowded beach. It's summer. It's time that people want to hang out, but we're going to make you comfortable. We're going to make you feel welcome. We're going to do all these things, and that was the thing that I love because there's so many, which this movie has these negative points because it does have kind of that Eurocentric American view of, Oh shit, Mexico could be dangerous. Your life could be endangered at any moment by some, you know, rogue kidnappers. It has that moment, but you kind of understand this is a billionaire. This is somebody with a lot of money. And so what people should understand is that shit ain't happening to regular ass folks. It doesn't happen. It never happened because there's no incentive to do it. If you have money and you go there and you're an asshole, or yeah, careless. shit's going to happen to you. Yeah, yeah or, or careless. Yeah. Shit's going to happen to you. Because even uh, even Neil, like, he's unmolested other than with the police. He's virtually unmolested because he's not, I hate to say this, he's not being a dick. 
<laughs> and it, the only time that I was fearful of him was when the guys came and sat with him on the beach. Right. And it was and it was kind of one of those things where I'm like, oh shit, they're setting him up for a scam. They're doing something. I've seen this play out. It's gonna happen. But then you realize that's again, there's a misdirect. That's not what happens. It's simply, you know, these guys, you know, they they know he has some money, so he might buy us some drinks. He might hang, you know, he might hang out with us. Yeah. But they know that he's not the guy who's in charge. You want somebody that's gonna be worth something. But I'm sorry. There's like so much in this movie that that <laughs> that redeems filmmaking as it presents a non-Western country, even though a Western actor is leading it and is the focal point. It's not one of these things where it's like, oh, Mexico's horrible. You should never go on vacation. If you go to vacation or to there or any of those brown countries, shit is going to happen to you. Yeah. So. I mean, a couple of things from what you were saying. I, I I love how the film is extremely visual, which might sound redundant because films mm-hmm. are supposed to be visual, but because it plays down dialogue so much, and I mean, in in a certain way, the protagonist is almost you know silent character, right? Mm-hmm. Um, it forces the weight of a lot of things that would normally be uh, executed through dialogue or narration or info dumping of some type just through the way where the camera is positioned and what information you're being given visually. So I thought just the emphasis on pure visuals, highlighting and leaning into the visual component of film, filmic storytelling. uh, I thought that was really good. And also like you were saying, there's a sense of authenticity and I was seeing, you know, I was gathering from interviews with the director who is Mexican, Michelle Franco, and we can talk about mm-hmm. some of his other filmography if we get to it, but um, fascinating, you know, uh, filmmaker who's considered a little bit of a provocateur by some. And um, he uh, was very clear that he wanted this to be shot on location in Acapulco. If he was not able to do that, he would not have made the film. And one of the things that was difficult for Tim Roth, who plays Neil, the protagonist, was to have that lack of response and to um, channel that very sort of detached demeanor in a place that is just hyper stimulating because they were on the actual beach in Acapulco and they didn't shut it down and populate it with extras. That was filmed Mm -hmm. in a real location with real people. Um, So I can see that for somebody maybe like Roth, who is used to working a lot of the time, I would presume in more controlled circumstances, that would be challenging to to not react to all of those things that are going on around you. I mean, you know, there's just a guy with a camera there. <laughs> like right. sound equipment. Um, but yeah, so I, I do think that that authenticity absolutely comes through um, from, from all of the scenes. Yeah. And I love seeing it represented because so much, so much of the times, you know, by having an open, you get to see what, what the Mexican population looks like, what they sound like, how how they're interacting in the background. Because I was looking at this and I honestly thought about it. It's like, oh shit, I haven't been to my in-laws in a couple of years just to, right. you know, to, to go to their beach town. Because that's the same type of vibe. It's like nobody gives a nobody gives a damn what you're wearing. Like, are you are you safe? Are you or more importantly, as far as my mother-in-law is concerned, are you hungry? Yeah, <laughs> that's, <I mean>. that's, <laughs> like I kid you not. Like that is the first and last question she'll ask me: Is did you have something to eat? Do you want something to eat? Are you okay? Are you hungry? And that's about it. Like because there is that genuine concern, that genuine care for somebody within their sphere, within their community, uh, and and even the idea of welcoming people into those communities that otherwise would have been outside. Um, you know, it, it's this is one of those communities where. Speaking of, of of Kino, it's one of those communities where there are no strangers, if that makes sense. Like, if, even if somebody is new to the area, people will greet them, will will make them welcome, uh, but they'll give them their space. It's like, look, we understand, you know, you, you're an Americano, you're a Canadian, you know, you come here. It's like, we just want to let you know, hey, you'll be safe, you'll be taken care of, everything's good, uh, but we're going to leave you alone. <laughs> so don't 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 worry about, you know you know, people disturbing your peace as you seek out peace. I I can't come visit your in-laws because I'm always hungry. So, uh, uh, trust me, you'll be fine. <laughs> They'll like you. Be fine. Yeah. 
You'll be. They'll fine. like me too much. That's that's my concern. They'll. Ven aquí, pinche güero quelero. <laughs> 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 I, I have to say too, just in terms of the filmmaking, you know, we we're talking about some of the some of the technical elements. I, I appreciate that it's a film that is very tightly written. You have mm -hmm. just enough to get you through to the next scene and and connect the dots. Uh, but everything serves a purpose or multiple purposes, mm -hmm. and I appreciate that that the storytelling done with economy, especially today, where films in some cases get very very long. Um, right. The I rewatched the film preparing for this conversation, and it's uh, one thing that I wanted to note is the right at the beginning, before you see anything, you hear the sounds of seagulls squawking and you hear mm -hmm. waves crashing, and those are exactly the things that you hear at the end of the film. There's perfect ah. symmetry between the opening sound and the closing sound. Nice. Um, I didn't think about that. Yeah. And I thought maybe a way to lead into the discussion a little bit is the first thing that you do see, which is fish dying. The opening shot, you, you know, he's out on a boat and there's some fish that is just essentially asphyxiating. And mm -hmm. um, you can, I think, uh, pretty reasonably make the case, and I would make the case, that it's a film about, in a sense, asphyxiation and uh, passing. The, the last gasps of the fish basically encompass the entire story of the protagonist. Everything that we're seeing ha is happening to the fish in those first few seconds. And what I love is that as he's studying the fish, he's kind of in a trance and he's startled out of his reverie by a towel being thrown at him. And Colin says, wake up. Right. So here's my question for you guys. Does he ever wake up? What does it mean to be awake? Hmm. Wow. We're going deep right away. Um, <laughs> man, I, well, if you uh, don't mind James. Uh, yeah, go, 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 go. I, I was going to say it for, it would be present as far as like the idea that yeah, death can happen at any time, which you, which you see with this film, it mm -hmm. can happen at any time, mm -hmm. uh, either through, you know, illness or, uh, violence, you know, it, it, or just, you know, something like an, uh, uh, oh my gosh, an accident. You know, it could be any of these things that come up. Um, so as far as the message, the audience, what that line is, you can't control anything that's taking place around you, you know, because the wheels are going to keep turning. The cogs are going to keep going. You can't control anything against, uh, 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 you can't control anything outside of your power. So you should focus on the things that you can as far as like spending that time with your family um, or, or not, you know, Sp try and figure out exactly what it is that's going to make you feel as though you matter in this, you know, on this small marble within a vast universe, you know, it, it's, it's hard to look at it, at least for me, it's hard to look at it any other way. Um, thinking about that line after having watched the film. What do you think, James? Uh, so a lot of this film to me is that he has coasted through life without being present mm -hmm. and, uh, and that he's starting to find the things that meant something to him, but he's also actively trying not to. Right. And uh, or maybe just trying to ignore them and not accept reality and not accept his diagnosis. And so when when you say the wake up, like, I feel like that's the point of the movie that that he needs to wake the fuck up and, and take part in life while he can. And I'm not sure that he ever does. So in in response to your does he wake up? I mean, sure, physically, but uh, on the uh, on the level of like what he needed to do. I think he starts to get there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I, I agree. I think that there's, there's a, there's a lovely rawness to the film and there's that quality of reality that we were discussing, which is fascinating because it's depicting someone that seems to be floating through in a kind of unreality. Um, and I agree. I think that he, wants to experience as much of the um, 
unfiltered way of life in Acapulco, right? So he wants to be away from the resort. He wants mm-hmm. to just be one with the average person in the beach. And the sound design, I think, is really extraordinary in the way that it gives you that sense of the constant music and the background voices. And there's always something going on in that mm-hmm. area. Mm-hmm. Yeah. He's he's hungry. I mean, like you were saying, you get, I think it's reasonable to infer that he's had a life of extreme wealth and privilege because of the family business. Uh-huh. Right. I think he might also have a kind of PTSD from the fact that, you know, w- what the business is engaged with, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah the the um, slaughterhouses and he is now at a point where he knows that he doesn't have much time um i think another very interesting question is what the ethics are of him keeping his diagnosis to himself or at least potentially to himself and to the lawyer richard i don't believe that anyone else seems to know what is happening with him um and it also raises the question though in my mind how much can he wake up because he has had a cancer that's metastasized in his brain and now he has a new tumor in his in uh, his frontal lobe i believe it was mm-hmm. yes so he might want to do all of these things and have an awakening and experience life you know in its in its full sensory you know um glory as much as possible but is that even possible is that even a, a, an experience that's now available to him cognitively because of where he's at i think that's a really interesting mm-hmm. question too that is. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I think part of what I was going for as well, I mean, I sort of hit this, but just to explain it more, even his refusal to go home. Mm-hmm. If he goes home, he has to start admitting things are wrong. He has to yeah. maybe start going to right. the doctor and yeah. doing the treatments. And as long as he's just in this paradise... Well, I can't go. I'm in Acapulco. You know, like it's just a built in excuse to not face reality while literally being in in a a, on a nonstop vacation, you know, and then then you add in like the the symbolism of the nonstop vacation and ignoring reality because that's what we do on vacation. We we Mm -hmm. don't go about our lives the way we normally do, you know, and I just. I feel like so many of these things work on multiple levels so well that even like having read spoilers, I knew instantly what was wrong with him through the whole thing. So I got to follow it that way and watching it that way. Like it just, it was so interesting to me because like, he doesn't go back to the super nice resort. You know, he just goes wherever he's just experiencing whatever. And, and he's distancing himself even from his vacation life, he's on a new vacation life. It's a new quest. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And like just all those little things that if I was watching it without knowing any of that, the story still works great. But I love these added levels of how he's actively working against all of this. Do you think that he's keeping his his condition to himself out of a sense of compassion for those he loves? Or simply because he's he's burned out, he doesn't want to deal with that life anymore, and he just wants to try to handle it as, on his own as much as possible. Oh, I got an answer for this one, because I got two, if not three people I know of currently doing this, or have been doing this. <laughs> um, I have some relatives that, that um, will not tell you until the absolute last minute like they're going to get surgery or that like my dad will call me won't tell me anything weeks prior like oh right. i'm having hip surgery i'm having eye surgery i'm having this right right he won't say a word and then you know my stepmom will call me like oh yeah your dad's out of surgery he's doing fine <laughs> and <laughs> thanks because it's for for his perspective It's, and it's kind of the same thing with me when I, you know, when I ever do anything medical, I will tell people way after Um, it's, I don't want to burden somebody else with what I've got going on. So that's the compassionate track. Yeah. 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 So I see it as more in that sense, because even the uh, Berenice who, who, you know, he, he has a thing for and a, and a fling with um, he can't even let, well, I'm sorry. The moment that she gets let in, he needs to escape he, again. He yeah. needs to leave. Right. And it and it's clear like Berenice is like, I don't give like I I'm in love with you. You know, I like you like we have good times together. We understand each other. 
And that idea of, I can't put you through this. Like, I care enough about you to where I don't want to put you through this. I care enough about my niece and nephew. I don't want to tell them this. And I'll let them hate me and be pissed off with me. Right. Thinking that I got their mom killed or I didn't give a shit about my family. So I decide because even the whole thing in that contract that the sister comes down with, it's Mm -hmm. you'll get the money as long as you keep in contact with your family once a month. Yeah. Like what? Like imagine like there's this moment with him where he's like, I don't want to burden anybody or or possibly I don't want anybody to feel sorry for me. Which I've seen that that reaction to people who have uh, not necessarily this type of illness, but not this specific illness, but a chronic condition or or a terminal one. I, I've seen this the same type of response where it's like I don't want to bother anybody. I don't want anybody to feel sorry for me. So, I mean, you have different levels with with respect to compassion as far as yeah. I don't want to use their emotional energy on this, but then also. I don't want somebody's emotional energy exercised uh, uh, on me in some type, uh, some type of sympathy for me mm-hmm. when I don't want to feel that. I'm sorry, James. Oh no, I I was uh, I was actually thinking about Norm Macdonald. Uh, I'm not normally a huge Norm Macdonald fan, but I watched this great show called The Dark Side of Comedy. And uh, I watched the Norm Macdonald episode and he was talking, he wasn't, but the others were talking about that very thing. Like he wouldn't tell them how bad his cancer was or how right. bad things were because right. he believed in not putting that burden on anyone. And and when you said that, it just took me directly back to that episode because those were the exact words. So that's what I was thinking about. Well, I love you too, James. <laughs> <laughs> So, you know, I, I think uh, another thing that's interesting, too, I was mentioning earlier the how little he speaks. He on, mm-hmm. There's only a couple of moments where he feels like it's necessary for him to engage in actual conversation. And I think most of those moments are um, scenes where he's trying to... The suffering of the other person is just so much that he needs to kind of, uh, you know, communicate something or even sometimes have a a simple gesture. Um, But I do think a standout scene for me in this film is when the sister flies all the way back after the funeral and finds him on the beach uh, and has a meltdown in public. What did you guys think of that scene? So first off, I, w- I want to back up for just a second with the sister because I have a, another question that ties into my answer to this. Did you guys feel that the beginning was kind of set up to make us feel like this was his wife and kids instead? That was 100% what I thought. I even wrote it down. I'm like, oh, fuck the kids is what I wrote down about like <laughs> not flying with them. I was like, God damn, he really doesn't like his mother-in-law. <laughs> but, but, then, but then it came clear. You're like, oh. Oh, and then I started questioning, like, why would the uncle go on vacation with? It's like, well, maybe the dad died, and now it's. It, it made me go in so many directions when I realized that this was a single man, father type figure that was with the family, um, and it, it it really made some of those other moments of his, um, I guess his ennui and his his lack of interest, his disinterest, like it made it make more sense because I mean, it, depending on the family, you can be close to your nieces and nephews, but this doesn't seem as though they were close nieces and nephews to the point where it's like they were buddy, buddy all the time and playing. It just seems like he was their mom's brother. So, so the reason yeah, I at, asked... at times, at times, I'm sorry. And, yeah. and I, I actually had a slightly different experience. Just to oh, answer your please question. do. Yeah. So, um, I didn't think that, that it was a, a couple. I didn't think that it was, you know, um, husband and wife, et cetera. But I, I also couldn't figure out exactly what the relationship was. The thing that, that made me feel like it wasn't the traditional romantic partnership was that she says to him very early on, thank you for joining us, which would just right. be such a bizarre statement to make to somebody that is expected to, to be there because they're part of that same family unit, right? That makes um, sense, yeah. 
So I'm like, I, I was thinking that he's not that, but he is close to them. And they do mm-hmm. have some kind of rapport. Like when Colin uh, adds booze to his drink and then he's, he tastes it and he's like, oh, you're such an asshole. You know, they, they have that understanding right. that some of the, some of that familiar patter that you would expect from having maybe spent other vacations together or having had some downtime together. So yeah, I wasn't sure what it was until much, much later in the film. So the reason I asked is, so I read spoilers, but it was like a week or two before I watched it. Okay. And then when I watched it, I'd kind of forgotten. And so at the beginning, that's what I'm thinking. And I'm like, I don't remember this in the spoilers, you know? And, uh, (laughs) and then when it then i then i figured it out and i was doing fine and then the scene hits where she comes on the beach and i was totally like this feels more like an angry ex-wife and maybe that's Mm -hmm. me putting my own life into this and projecting but uh it just it felt more like an angry ex-wife to me and so i got distracted by that and didn't really hit what your your question was actually about here and i just wanted to explain why but i didn't know if you guys Mm -hmm. felt this weird thing to begin with as well but uh like I, again he just sits there and takes it right like she's screaming mm-hmm. at him and he's not even looking at her he's just sitting there <laughs> looking at the water <laughs> yeah and i'm like this guy is so checked out it's crazy but yeah uh obviously he has well, his reasons but what about you don when i was gonna say i played off that line about thanks for coming as i'm like oh shit they're estranged maybe they're you know, uh, trying to get back together, you know, I so see. I, you know, I so see. that, so I, I, I was already that mindset of like, well, maybe they're together. Maybe this is one of those, Hey, we're trying to do something together with the kids. But when, when that flip happened at flip, as far as like me realizing who's their relationship, yep. I was like, that makes so much more sense now as right. far as why he was, why he was the way he was. And it adds to why the mom was working or accepting yeah. phone calls and emails right. and stuff like that while they were there. I'm, I'm sitting here like, God, this, this mom is a workaholic. What the hell is going on? <laughs> and I realized why she's, why, you know, she's still quote unquote working on, on vacation is because, you know, she can't depend on her brother. I mean, like her brother's not taking over the business cause he's dying. Um, and it, yeah. And you, you see, he's, he's already checked out. There's that very, oh, yeah. where, uh, six minutes in, he's lying in a hammock over an infinity pool, and his cell phone just keeps ringing and ringing and ringing. He's not even moving. Yep, he's not even checking to see what he's missing. <laughs> he's just out, 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 out. Um, I, I like that scene on the beach because I, I do think it takes a lot of um, discipline from the point of view of the actor, but then also just the the way that the character is being portrayed to not have any lapse into reactivity to the mm-hmm. you know huge volume both in decibels and in terms of emotional output that that she's projecting at that point i just think it's right. beautifully played off and oh, yeah. that 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 really hit me yeah there's just there's so many scenes where not reacting says so much and and like you just said the volume in both ways Man, that that sums that up so well, and not even not even from an acting point of view, but just how infuriating it would be to be her in that moment. Like he abandoned you and made you go to your mom's funeral he, he, alone. He hasn't been responding. He's lying. He, he's, he's lying. Oh, yeah, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> but then he's also like he doesn't strike me as he's been involved with the business in many years like he's cashing out but is he doing yeah. anything you know no, even he before says, all he this says my sister's been managing the business on her own basically yeah it, right. it's not like it's not like she's seeing a difference in him to be able to go hey what's wrong she's so sick of this dude you know <laughs> and uh and yeah, and then you're pouring your heart out because you are clearly the victim here. And this asshole won't even look at you or acknowledge it. Like mm-hmm. NB bro, it's a new genre. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so so while his performance is great, also the emotion that she's giving us and everything she's saying about her character and backstory in that moment, screaming at him and getting nothing, you know, like 
God, when you say this is a tight script, like it's not even that. It's an absolute mastery of motivation and reaction and and just so much characterization. James, I, I agree. And I, I also wanted to highlight, you know, because it's related to this scene, uh, 45 minutes in after he's agreed to relinquish his share, mm-hmm. he, you know, there there's a visible relief that he has after having that conversation with her. And he just looks at her and he says, shall we have dinner? And she says, what? Right. <laughs> it's just so confusing to her that he could be nonchalantly suggesting that they grab a bite after the conversation they've had. And he's that just might be very line ready. in the whole movie. <laughs> <laughs> had to single that out too. I, I, also on that line, uh, along those lines, the way his body language shifts after they, when he's stepping out of the airport, he's exiting the airport. He's just seems so much more relaxed when they're gone. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Plus it's, it's, it's also that mask of having to present yourself to other people. Mm-hmm. You know, if you don't like when I, when I would go, you know, I, I said, I, I was, I jokingly told James before we recorded, I'm like, I'm not talking about any time I go to Mexico. Um, like that, same thing, not as far as like the relief of, oh, I'm away from the fa-. It's the idea that I'm someplace where I don't have to talk to anybody if I don't want to. Like everything else at home is taken care of. But if I want to get up and simply just go get something to eat and go back to my room, I mean, this is any time that I happen to go someplace and go to my room. I don't have to talk to anybody. Um I don't have to, you know, be inundated with questions. If they know that I'm sick, it's always, are you okay? How are you feeling today? What's going on? Or if they don't know I'm sick, it's that thing of like, what if I become vulnerable in front of them? Like I happen to start coughing up blood or I have to represent, uh, I present any other types of symptoms because I, 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 I can only imagine if that scene where he's going up the stairs with, with Berenice and he falls down the stairs, spoiler alert, he yep. falls down the <laughs> stairs and they take him to the hospital and like, oh yeah, your cancer's gotten worse, it's metastasized, it's spread, it's done this. Um, where she understands that as far as what's going on because she takes him to the hospital. You know, She gets him the help. I wonder what it would have looked like if it had been the sister doesn't know what's going on You know, there are other people who do. The sister doesn't know what's going on. He happened to fall at the resort. They take him to the hospital. She finds out that he has cancer. This is a completely different story. This is a completely different movie as opposed to we get this moment where this individual, I guess his fear, or at least one of the fears that he has is that vulnerability, that, 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 uh, uh, the, the fear of mortality, um, but there's also that acceptance of it. But I think the fear is more about what is somebody else going to have to deal with when I'm gone. Right. As opposed to if I go ahead and cut all these attachments with all these other people, they don't have to worry about taking care of me. I'm just gone. Yeah. I'm no longer here. They can hear about, Oh yeah, your uncle died two weeks ago in Mexico and they sent his remains back or, you know, he was, he left a note saying that he wanted to be cremated and have his, his ashes spread in the, in the ocean. Um, you know, I could see, I could see so many great things being presented in this film that are talking about, you know, not just, well, I guess the human condition itself, but also the way in which humans respond to different types of trauma, different types of experience, different types of crises, whether it's directly impacting them or if it's impacting somebody they know or know of. But yeah, it, 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 yeah. this movie scared me in, in more ways. Whenever we had that discussion about whether or not this is horror, this is horror, this is horror. This, this, the shooting didn't scare me. The other shooting didn't scare me. The fault, you know, the gore and all that stuff didn't scare me. It was that idea of, what is going to happen when it is your time and you know, your time is coming because the, a lot of people have the fortune of not knowing, but if you know that you've got a fatal disease, a fatal condition, like what, how would you handle that? And that's something that you don't know until it happens. And in his case, it's fuck it. I don't want to bother anybody. I don't want anybody to worry about. I want to sit at, I want to sit on the big beach and drink. And I guess this is the question I would ask either one of you, or it's perfect time to ask this question. If you had a certain amount of time, let's say a year, six months, 
um, like you knew you had limited amount of time left, like what would be your focus? I mean, aside from family, you know, family, friends, making sure that you caught up with everybody, made amends, like what would you go and do? I would just make your life a living hell, Don. Like, what are you going to do about it? Uh, <laughs> what did the doctor say? How many months, James? <laughs> but how, how would that be doctor different, was, James, for doctor was wrong. <laughs> You don't know my diagnosis. No. Um, yeah. I mean, obviously family and all of that, but uh, for myself, I, uh, my dad desperately wanted to get to the Czech Republic and Australia in his lifetime. And he didn't get to go to either. And so I carry this weird thing where I want to go to each and just get dirt from them and bring it back to his grave. And, and so that is what I would do. I, I would go on both of those trips and take care of that because it's one of the things in my life I really wanted to do. Mm -hmm. uh, outside of that, I, I, I'm a wimp, man. I, if you, if I get Lou Gehrig's like my grandfather had, like, uh, I'm going to Robin Williams myself. Like, it's that simple. And I don't even feel bad saying that because... I, everything with losing your brain and who you are terrifies the living shit out of me. Mm. So even like the brain tumors Neil has, like you're, you're going to lose who you are. Right. And so, yeah. So mine would be family, uh, taking care of a few things going on those trips and going out while I'm me. Right probably more honesty than you wanted, but still. I, I can certainly relate to that. I mean, I think, and we can, we can tie this back to the film as well because of the title that it has, because that raises a whole different question. Um, but I, I would say just an answer to what you've posed Don. that. Mm -hmm. I try, I try to live my life now for the most part, as though I know that I'm going to die in the not very long term future. Mm -hmm. By which I mean, I try to prioritize the things that are important to me, not knowing right. when I'm going to die, right? So for the most part, I'm doing the things that I would do. The only thing mm -hmm. that I think would be different would be some uh, travel uh, along the lines of what you were saying, James. There's a couple of places that I'd like to go where right now I think, well, you know, I can I can do that in the future. And uh, when it's more convenient from a mm -hmm. uh, work perspective or financial standpoint or whatever. So I would just, I would definitely, you know, uh, jump on the chance to do those and bump them to the top of the list. But for the most part, everything else, I, it would be the same. But then I, I would also echo what you were saying in terms of if it was something where I knew that it was going to be a very uh, low, uh, if it was going to be a very progressive cognitive decline, I would define mm -hmm. what, you know, the point beyond which I would not want to progress in mm -hmm. that in that decline. And, I, and that would just simply be, you know, end of life kind of definition and arrangement of affairs. And that's how I would handle that as well. Um, okay. But but coming back to the title of the film, uh, that was another thing that I wrote down. Is he experiencing a metaphorical or spiritual sundowning in the sense of someone who has dementia? Mm. Hmm. It's like, you know, apparently, uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's well documented how symptoms of different types of dementia can become exacerbated during the later part of the day, right? Absolutely. Light fades right. And, and all of the, the symptoms of confusion and disorientation and possibly even depersonalization increase. And so I wonder if, in, in a sense, the entire uh, sequence of events that we see would be like those few minutes. Mm-hmm you know, rid over a period of days or weeks of someone who has become more un disconnected and just lost their anchor because of uh, dementia related, or in this case, you know, tumor related cognitive impairment. Right. Hmm. I didn't think about, I, I didn't think about the title in that sense. I talk, thought about the title in the sense of like, we normally talk about the sunset of our lives as far as when right. that time is coming. Right. So I just I just thought of this as a similar thing as far as like waiting because where he's well where he is staring as far as the 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 beach and everything I kept thinking about you know what would his what would his vantage vantage point be uh, if he were 
looking at the water? Like what, what specifically is he going to be looking for? And Acapulco itself is on the West coast of Mexico. So I kept thinking like, okay, well maybe he's waiting for like the perfect, you know, sunset. He's looking for the perfect uh, uh, color of the sun on the horizon. Like I'm looking at all these different ways that sundown was working. And Hmm. because when James sent me the title, I'm like, Oh shit! It's gonna be a. T- it's gonna be about that town in Arkansas where you know, they don't they don't allow any people of color to live. Oh great! Uh, but no, it was just it was just one of those things. I looked. I was like, well, with with Acapulco itself, it should you should be able to see a good sunset and have that serve as the metaphor of like you know he's 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 gotten that last thing he was waiting for, and now he's comfortable leaving everything behind. Uh, because part of me was thinking like, this would be a funny play on England um, because he has this moment where he's telling, he's telling Berenice who's, you know, obviously never been away from Acapulco right, uh, right. From, from her, con- at least never been away from Mexico. I should say uh, he's like, Oh yeah, you should come to, you should go to Paris. You should definitely go to Paris. You, oh, should, yeah, go you should go to Rome. Yeah. Yes. yeah. You, should go, you should go to London where I'm from. And I'm thinking to myself like, Wow. The way in which this guy does not understand other people's situations. But then I realized that this was a person that he was interested in having a conversation with. And you're seeing that authentic side of him where he's not thinking about, you know, economic constraints or or anything like that. It's like, oh, shit, I actually like you. We get along. You know, here's some things that you should definitely do because you're going to enjoy it. This will be great. This will be great. And that's the, that's the one time. You know, you see like joy out of him. Yeah, and it was a, it was a great contrast to you know to the to the indifference that we see a lot of the time with him. But you kind of understand why he's doing that because he found somebody that isn't looking for anything from it. Even though that's kind of where you get suspicious as far as like you know what what role is she playing? You know, is she is she scamming? Is she is she you know possibly a sex worker that's that's out trying to to do that? Uh, because you see those people come through as far as like the scammers, the kidnappers, right. the you know, even that guy on the beach that that uh, she saves him from where the guy's <laughs> like, hey, why don't you come to the nightclub? And she says, hey, hey, back oh, off. We're just, we're just talking. It's like, no, I know how your talks end and like kicks him out. And then he and immediately it's, targets the next person right next to Did you see yeah, that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so I'm sitting there like, holy I shit, that. this That's is really great. true. Holy shit, this is very accurate. It's it's always that thing of like be suspicious, but then also you've got people who are being authentic where they will walk up to you, my friend, my friend, my friend, come by this, my friend, come to this shop, my friend, come into this this restaurant. You know, it's just part of the sales pitch, sales pitch, but you also have scammers that take advantage of it because they're like, Oh yeah, you know, I know this American's gonna be off guard, this Westerner's gonna be off guard, I'm gonna be able to do this. But I love the fact that she comes in and you realize that she's not a taker. Right. She's somebody who's like, even, even when he pays too much, it's kind of like, oh, well, do you have anything smaller? We don't have, you know, it's only 20, it's, it's, it's only 20 pesos. Like, you know, we don't have anything that could break that. Yeah. And I, right, right. You know, she could have easily, oh, thank you. Because I've been in those situations where you didn't have change and the person's like, you know, all right, it was 20, but you just gave me 50. Have a good day. And not being rude, it's kind of like if you don't have the change, you know, <laughs> and you have to be a foreigner that doesn't speak the speak the language. I hate to break it to you, but you know, hook up the hook up Duolingo and 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 Rosetta Stone more, and you won't have to worry about that as much, or just have smaller bills. I think that you touch on something really interesting that the conversation that they're having, it is one of the most, it is one of the moments when he displays the most emotion openly, at least. Mm -hmm. And I I speculate that one of the things that she finds so attractive about Neil is that he has no agenda. He's right with responding to anything as it flows in the moment. And it makes me think that that is some, that she also has no agenda and therefore she's very sympathetic to someone who shares that way of being in the world. Um, Mm -hmm. And it's remarkable how they're able to enter a relationship that seems to be uh, joyous and deep and 
you know, has plenty of things besides the physical component to it. And yet they're able to accomplish all of this with almost no dialogue. Right. Maybe, maybe it just wasn't on screen. No. Um, (laughs) I think their conversation is also such a cool doorway into him because how do I want to put this? My happy, excited me is not me. It's a part of me, but it's not who I normally am. And when Mm. I'm in those moments and I get to act like he's acting, like say I'm having an amazing panel at a a Comic-Con or we're hanging out in the bar afterwards or whatever, Don, Don knows the difference. He knows when I'm my happy con self versus who I am, right? And what I like about this is that we see yet another side of him but there's never a true him of who he was in London, if that makes sense. Okay. Like, yeah. Like, I think this part of him existed in London, but, and, and I think it's a part of himself that he likes and he would like to be in that kind of moment more. But I'm still fascinated by how, like I said earlier, he's always shifting and we're seeing different pieces of him, right? Yeah. And, mm-hmm. and I think that, that that's what this is. This is a non vacation part of him, this exists the rest of the time. But but we still don't know who he was. Right. And, and yeah, and I, I think complementing that, she brings out something in him that he likes experiencing in himself that he doesn't have on his own. And one of the things that made me feel that way is the scene where they arrive at this, it's some, some kind of social gathering and it could be a restaurant or some other event, but it, it the camera clearly shows that he tugs on her arm. He kind of pulls her forward and chooses where they're going to sit, which is the first time that he demonstrates any kind of uh, assertiveness, let's just say, right. in, in terms of his body language. And he has a little smile on his face also when they sit down at that point. Um, so, you know, there's also the little scene where the guitar player comes on the beach and they do seem to be very much in love. And, you know, they, they, the, the guy kind of makes a joke about it. <laughs> He's like, los enamorados. <laughs> <laughs> You're thinking you have no idea what kind of twisted romance this guy's playing a song for. <laughs> Doomed romance. <laughs> Man. Um, I also wanted to ask you guys about the scene right before he falls down the stairs. To me, it was at the level of Godfather horse head in bed scene uh-huh. where he is having the hallucination of a pig that's all been butchered. And it's just waiting in the apartment for them. Um, I think that it's so interesting that we as the audience get a quick shot of the pig and all the blood and the pieces Mm -hmm. of the pig before the door opens. Mm -hmm. It's almost as though we're inside his head. That's what he's expecting to see. And then the door opens. And of course, she has no reaction to it because there's nothing physically there. But for him, it's absolutely real. and that there's a, there's in the sound mix there's that high pitched ringing that has happened at several intervals leading up to that scene. Like the first time I noticed it, the second watch, the second time I watched it was about seven minutes into the film, and that it, it certainly cues you off that there's some kind of problem that he that he's having in his sensory processing of the world. But yeah, I thought that that was visually the way that it was staged, the the head of the pig, all of that. I thought it was um, really really fine. What did you guys mm-hmm. think? Uh, for oh me, yeah, for me it was uh, you know, that whole thing I said about how he's trying not to face reality, right? And he's yep. trying not to look at death, and he's trying not to interact with anything that that is real. And uh, and I take this as given their family business that he had to see death a lot at the business. Mm. Mm-hmm. He right. saw the pig slaughtered that way, and. I take this as that was his introduction to death and, uh, and, and that it traumatized him on some level, right? Like, I don't know if that's why he's not involved in the business and just cashes out. I don't want to go that far, but uh, obviously what he saw stuck with him to the point that when, uh, whether, whether it's subconscious or not, when, when his mind knows that it's, it's coming, that's what he sees. He goes mm-hmm. back to that trauma and that yep. 
exact shot of whatever hit him when he was young. And I, I'm not going to fully assume that that's what you both took, but I think that that's what viewers are supposed to take from that. And, and that goes back to the tight writing because we didn't need some fucking flashback to some kid right. getting a pig right. slaughtered. Right. It's just there. And it's, I don't know. It was so powerful to me how well that was done. Yeah, you didn't need words for it. Um, my my reaction was pretty much the same as what you're saying. This idea of impending doom. Something bad is going to happen. I even wrote them down my notes, so I was like, oh, uh, the Grim Pooper. Uh, you know, because the whole Harry Plopper, Spider Pig thing. But anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but I was thinking, I was like, oh, that's a really cool convention to express, like, something bad is going to happen or somebody's going to die um, or something specifically is going to be- bad happen is going to happen to Neil. Um, but just the, the graphic nature of it, because you see the, the other time you see a pig, it's in uh, the, the, the jail. Uh, yeah. The shower and, scene. Yeah. And it's, it's, he's just so disgusted by seeing it, but you don't get why he's so disgusted by seeing it until that that moment where they're going into the apartment um because that that butchered i wouldn't even say that's a butchered pig that's a slaughtered pig <laughs> like it's it's insides are are i mean it's completely disemboweled it, it's insides or outsides um and that itself is a horrific scene and i could imagine or i shouldn't say that i i can't imagine uh what that would be like the first time you see it as a child if you happen to see it as a child uh, because as an adult, seeing it on film from the safety of the space of my office through a computer screen, it was still disturbing. It was still something that I didn't yeah. want to, I, I didn't want to anticipate the character coming across. Yeah, I mean, I saw it in the same way, but but probably also because of my own personality, I read it as guilt, right? I saw it as this is the past that he's tried to get away from. He's now gone all the way. He, he, he's, he's legalized his divorce from this part of his life by right. giving over the, the business and not, you know, making it clear to Richard that he's not going to be involved in anything except seeing the kids quote unquote, you know, once a month or whatever. Right. And, but he can't get away from it. He can't get away from what the slaughterhouses do. He can't get away from whatever memories he has of touring those facilities or, you know, as you were saying, possibly being exposed to to what goes on in the inside when he was maybe younger and more impressionable. And, you know, in the same way that um, it, it has been suggested and there are other stories that show that near the moments of death, a character will have will will have that racing heartbeat and that sense of everything accelerating in the last few moments and they'll see pictures of their children he mm-hmm. sees he sees the pigs and they keep coming back and they keep coming back more and more often you know there's the pig in the shower scene but then there's also pigs on the beach at night which is probably in his head um because there's no other you know substantiation of that by anybody else and then this this scene with the pig so it, yeah to me it felt like Absolutely suggestive of impending doom, but also uh, part of his past that he can't evade no matter how hard he tries. And it's the guilt is also consuming him for knowing that he has been benefiting from the extreme wealth and privilege that has come from that business. Mm-hmm. I, you just can't, it's like it's like the scene in Macbeth. You can wash your hands as much as you want from the deed, but the blood is still there. Right. Yeah, and I, I had to remind that. myself, I'm like, where were the swimming pigs? And it was on the other side of Mexico. They're in the Yucatan. Uh, <laughs> so I'm like, nope, you wouldn't even have the swimming. You wouldn't have had the beach pigs even on that no, coast. Right, right. right. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I really like that because that that totally plays into my my theory that he's just trying to outrun everything. And so mm-hmm. you're bringing it to follow him. And literally, when he comes face to face with it, that's when it ends, right? Like, so that's beautiful. I I love everything you just said about that. I, I also I also think it's incredibly ironic in a way that by seeking to detach himself from the inheritance and the family business, 
He inadvertently sets off a chain of events that put it back solely on his shoulders. And he Mm. has to end up giving it to the children because he is, he becomes the lone heir through his own accidental, you know, misdoing or lack of doing. And so I was thinking you could, you can sort of interpret that in, in one way, at least to suggesting that avoidance Mm -hmm. leads to the same place as acceptance, just in a much messier fashion. Man, that, that's uh, that's so many stories right there. Like that's just a beautiful uh, map for storytelling. There's a a phrase that's something to the effect of when you try to outrun your destiny, you'll find it. Uh, right. I'm I'm killing it, but that's that's the the general idea, and I feel like that's the same thing. He was only you know not in a positive way, but <laughs> right. uh, yeah, it's just that that that's just one of those things that not only do I fully believe in, but I've sort of experienced in my life. And, uh, you know, I, I don't know. That's just something that really resonates with me is what I guess I'm trying to say. Yeah. I think, I think that, you know, coming back to why I picked this film, uh, I, I've really responded strongly to Michelle Franco's other films that I've seen. Uh, Tim Roth is also the lead actor in his 2015 film chronic which is another feel-good film about a palliative end-of-life care worker um played by tim roth (laughs) and is possibly even more depressing than this one um and then uh april's daughters or or las hijas de abril um was very controversial when it came down new order nuevo orden was apparently uh, not liked in mexico itself it's a near future a very dystopian and violent um kind of civilization collapses mm-hmm. um, film very, very different in tone because of the scale of it and, and how loud it is compared to sundown and uh, memory um, was the most recent one, which I was lucky enough to see in a movie theater, which is a uh, very intimate and uh, dark drama uh, featuring Jessica Chastain and, uh, and Peter Sarsgaard. But I think that one of the through lines of some of these films and the reason I'm kind of rattling off some of these other titles is because there is this preoccupation that Franco has with what I would describe maybe as an aesthetics of aloofness characters who are just whether through trauma or choice, not able or not wanting to connect with the environment around them. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you mentioned horror before it on this film, I think, is clearly not, you know, genre in the, in the main sense that we would understand what genre protocols are, but it does have a very disquieting, unnerving quality to it mm-hmm. right from the very beginning, um, which I think, you know, uh, makes it overlap to some degree with some of our more maybe ambitious or sophisticated genre stories. And that idea of having this this aesthetics of aloofness to me it's it's fascinating to try to juxtapose that with genre because in genre like like you were saying james typically we we want more of an explanation we want that flashback or we expect to have the full context for why a character is behaving the way that they're behaving so there's this really interesting tension between the darkness of the aesthetics which could be the same as what we find in genre with with an aloofness and a kind of dissociative approach to the, to the make to the characters that seems to be pulling against what those genre expectations are. Yeah. The final thing there's at about an hour and uh, two minutes in after he's been released from the jail for, you know, the arrest on suspicion of whether he had anything to do with his girl, with his sister's um, kidnap attempted kidnapping and, and uh, death. Mm-hmm. He he's, he's in the, in the cab with um, Richard, with the lawyer. Right. And he, you know, Richard very authoritative, authoritatively tells them to head to the airport. And so he, he gets, he literally goes, gets out of the jail and they're directly from the jail on the way to the airport. And as they're, you know, part of the, part of the ride through, he just looks over and he has this little, almost invisible smirk on his face. And he says to Richard, back to the hotel. Yeah. <laughs> and Richard looks at him like, do you understand how outrageous that is right now? <laughs> With everything that has happened, you know, all 
the 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 air the arage to this fortune, all of the paperwork that has been transacted, people flying mm-hmm. back and forth. You know, we're we're only exposed to the absolute tip of that iceberg. But can you imagine all of the hassle and you know bureaucratic running around that is oh, happening yeah. behind the scenes and employees confused and you know stock markets rising and falling and and with all of that, he spent multiple nights in jail. And the only thing he tells him is back to the hotel. <laughs> Right. <laughs> I just I just wanted to say I absolutely adored the the attention to detail that 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 Roth brought to that micro smirk when he said that as though okay I have to acknowledge as far gone as I am this is absolutely insane behavior. <laughs> mm-hmm. Maybe that's the most real that he is. Maybe that's the him that we're looking for, you know? <laughs> Possibly. Um, I will say one of my, it's not a complaint, it's just a little thing that rubbed me weird, was that Roth's character is uh, is accused of killing his sister when he doesn't even know what happened. And I would have just liked a scene where the cab driver says it was him. Like, like just something to push it more in that direction that would have just made that a little stronger for me. As it was, it just felt kind of weird that they just... If they weren't making concessions for him, it would be different. But it was like, like they accuse him and then and then like give him his own cell and stuff. Like I don't know, it just felt weird to me. I would have liked a little tiny tap in that direction instead. All right, Jimothy, let me tell you a story here, bud. <laughs> uh, one, they would have separated him one because of the the bunny issue and the, the idea that you don't want to have anybody else in Gen Pop really taking a pop at him. Um, but also, oh, shoot, you brought up the, well, there's, the there's, a line, right? yeah, there's a line where they say that he was cited with the, the perpetrators. Like there were witnesses right. that reported that they had Saw seen him at the beach and they're out with those people. Yeah. And, and the way that sometimes the federales will be historically speaking, um, if you're an American that's anywhere close to something that happened, your ass is going to. <laughs> it's especially in this type of situation, which when one of the times I was when I was in TJ, I just went to one of the, the food carts and the I don't know if it was a nightclub or a pool hall or whatever that's that is situated behind where the 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 food food cart was. Um but when the, when the curtain flew open, I could see that. I'm sorry, when the door flew open, I could see that there were pool tables in there. So I don't know exactly what was going on. All I know is I'm sitting there at the food cart uh, with uh, a woman, her 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 grandchild, and then probably about 20 federales roll in with M16s, grabbing everybody in there. And I'm like, fuck, I'm not going to go home today because it was kind of clear, like anybody over there needs to stay there, and then one of the people came out or came around and was like, Oh yeah, you guys can go, <laughs> you know, just move on down. We've got, we've got to take care of this, this situation in here. Um, because there, there've been, especially if you're, uh, uh, I, I shouldn't even say you're a if you're a Westerner, like Neil's character and having been seen with those individuals, there's not going to be any confusion as far as like, Oh yeah, you can immediately go. It's no, we have people who saw you with them. Yeah, and Berenice too. She so they, yeah. they had witnesses had cited both of them, you know, consorting with the perpetrators of the crime. I think that that right. was, in, for my mind, that was reasonable enough cause for them to hold him at least and, and ask him some questions. All right. Oh yeah, and it, and if I had been by the cart and somebody, let's just say a guy had a cigarette and he asked me for a light at that time, and then the police swarmed in, I'm seen with that person. They're taking me as well. Right. And then it'll be like, oh, well, you had nothing to do with it. Bye. Um, it, it's 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 a procedural thing. Uh, not only that, it's a high profile situation. So that's what I was uh, thinking, too, because of the yeah. because of their status. And I mean, their name is in the newspaper. Oh, right? yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. A story out in the world. Yeah. The Mexican mm-hmm. police are not in the tradition of you're going to embarrass us. Like we're going to go on the offense. It's not going to be oh this 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 rich wealthy woman got killed. We're looking for her 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 abductors. We're looking for her murderers. We're looking for whoever whoever did something to her, whether she was kidnapped or murdered. It's we got the people. We got everybody that they hang out with, 
and we're gonna we're gonna lean on everybody until they talk to us. And that's uh, you know it's it's a heavy handed approach, um, but you know that's that's what gets done in in some of the in some of the states in Mexico. Some more than others. <laughs> the, the guy from the consulate that shows up. It, it, I thought that was really uh, expertly done too. When he looks, at, he gives them the newspaper, and I do think you see genuine shock and sadness in Neil when he finds out that his sister. Oh, absolutely! Is and then the guy looks at me, he's like, "Why didn't you go to your mom's funeral?" <laughs> like he can't right. figure out how, why is this guy so detached from everything. And the way he just looks back at him, like back off, understand the news that you've just given me to process. How dare mm-hmm. you ask me why I didn't go to the funeral? That has that is absolutely none of your business. <laughs> right? It's sort of this really intimidating look, which again is one of the rare moments where he plays off the, that intensity that that I think comes so easily to him as an actor. But he's he's consciously avoiding for most of the performance. I thought that was great. Oh, a thousand percent. Yeah, no, that that all makes way more sense, especially the uh, the level of the crime and stuff like that. So. <laughs> I, I hope that anyone listening to this will give the films of Michelle Franco a chance. I am advocating <laughs> for this filmmaker. I think he does extraordinary work. And uh, again, quite different. I, I don't necessarily uh, think that he can be lumped in with sort of art house cinema in the sense that I think he wants his movies to be seen by a broader audience. And in particular, that dystopian um, movie that I was mentioning, Nuevo Orden, you know, is on a larger scale and, and I'm sure did pretty well in the box office, at least in Mexico. Um, mm-hmm. But he's certainly not a mainstream filmmaker either. So I think he's just very interestingly doing his own thing. And uh, I hope I hope people will explore his work. Fantastic. Well, I mean, we're already obviously starting movie recommendations since you just recommended a bunch of this. Do you have any more to add? If people liked this film, what else should they watch? I do. I have two um, companion pieces that I was thinking about. One is The Turin Horse from 2011 by Bella Tarr, which in it, it's not necessarily an obvious connection, but the theme of accepting fate or resigning yourself to fate and what the difference is between acceptance and resignation, uh, I think ties to this film quite nicely. The other one that I would recommend, uh, because I, I want everyone to suffer as much as I have, if not more, is <laughs> Uh, Vortex by Gaspar Noé, which is an excruciating, very, very long, uh, aggressively uncomfortable film about dementia and end of life. And uh, most of the film is actually two. It's a split screen, which when you do that for hours, uh, it becomes very exhausting. Oh, man. And um, it's extremely realistic. It, it, its approach, its relationship with reality is similar to Sundowns in the sense of being very unadorned and raw. And it does deal with, again, characters that are at the end of their life. One of them has dementia and the other character is not necessarily uh, able to accept that. And terrible things happen as a result of that non-acceptance. So that would be a great pick-me-up for, you know, (laughs) (laughs) you could start with Vortex and then do Sundown to, to sort of, Uh, palette cleanse a little bit nice all right for my double feature i'm going with a 2022 film called piggy uh piggy is just (laughs) utterly fantastic and uh takes place in spain uh but they have shared themes of isolation uh moral dilemmas uh and and making choices in your life shall we say um (laughs) Yeah, I just I feel like these two would be really good together. Uh, Piggy is not as depressing, but it's definitely not a happy-go-lucky film. So right. there you go. That's my my double feature. So Don, what are your three hundred and forty-five movies? <laughs> uh, I'm so damn right. Uh, so <laughs> out of the movies, I'm going to go with uh, Tigers Are Not Afraid. Um, yes. I Love believe it was the Chinese. I'm sorry, not was a Chinese film. It was a film based on an American's experience in China, which I think is Red Door with Richard Gere. Oh uh, yeah, Girl in the Picture, Shawshank Redemption, uh, 
the night manager inside job. I see you. Uh, and since I've got to mention another, uh, but another Gone Girl movie. Uh, well, one I'm going to mention, Gone Girl. But then I'm also going to mention I Care A Lot, uh, The Unforgivable, The Lie, uh, Prisoners, Mystic River, Nocturnal Animals, Moonlight, Inheritance, The Visit, um, and literary literary recommendations. I would go with Camus, The Stranger, or Richard Wright's Native Son to talk about the isolation and, and the idea of indifference uh, when you are you know, informed about something bad that happened. And last but not least, and yes, James, this is a serious recommendation. I stress, this is a serious recommendation. Every season of 90 Day Fiance. <laughs> because that was exactly where my mind went with Berenice and like, he's a, they're in love now. I'm like, oh, <laughs> if, this, if this were TLC, he would fly home Right. Immediately start the K one process, and then oh my gosh, I met this girl when I was in Acapulco, and you know my my sister happened to get killed one of the times that I was down there, and it really brought us together. I'm going to bring her to America, like that would be the whole that would be the whole that would be the whole season. When this that show ends, domestic trouble. Six months later, she's living yeah. there. Yeah, <laughs> Don, Don. When this show ends, I would like you to start a new show where you just analyze movies as if they were 90 day fiance movies, because that was amazing. (laughs) Oh, don't get me started on jaws. (laughs) (laughs) You know, because those were waters that the shark was not used to and he was acclimating. Okay. (laughs) Much like any, any individual that comes to the United States on a K not K one visa, they have to acclimate to the predators that are seeking them out because a lot of the people on that show are horrible human beings <laughs> and predators. Beautiful. Free Michael. Oh, man. Free Michael. <laughs> All right. Let's bring it back to you. Alvaro. Uh, where can people follow your stuff? Like the, uh, the blog or the, Blog article? What what do you Yeah, it's a bi bi weekly column. So column, just, thank you. That's yeah. the word I was looking for. Go ahead. Uh Poppies of Terra. And you just if you search by that phrase, it's published by Hex, so it's very easy to find. And uh, again, the most recent books are Equimedian and Being Michael Swanwick. Those are available through whatever uh, online retailers of choice. Fantastic. All right, man. Well, we loved having you back again. And uh, thank you for, for having me watch this because now it's, uh, I don't, this is one of those movies I'm going to be thinking about for a long time, man. It was a lot of fun to have the conversation. And oh, uh, definitely. I, I do think that the film is a little bit different if you go in not knowing anything about his diagnosis. Oh, so, sure. yeah. Uh, uh, it, yeah, fascinating that you that you can get multiple different experiences wow. from the one film that are quite different. Mm-hmm. Love it. Thanks so much for having me. Appreciate it. Of Absolutely. Course, of course. I suppose that wraps it up for another week. As always, I'm James Sabata. And uh, I'm waiting for James to figure out what pinche Wedo culero means after he does his Google search later. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> and we will see you next week here at the Necronama.com. I can't believe that we didn't talk about Michelle Franco's Afro. Yeah, we should have, man. That is, that is some serious puffiness going on. Like I'm upset that his Afro looks 10 times better than any Afro I ever had when I was a kid. Um, And now I have no hair. So I guess there's wigs.